Okay, guys, now we'll cover some of the rehab considerations for obese patients. So, you know, um, again, as we kind of discuss all the pathophysiological changes that occur in obesity, you know, obesity is associated with impairments, obviously muscle performance, um, which increases the likelihood of developing functional mutations in mobility, strength, and balance. We talked about what happens with the center of, of mass shifting anterior, right? If they have a, a large, especially if they have a large panis. Uh, obese individuals, regardless of age, tend to have greater absolute maximal strength. If we, if we look at raw strength, right? But if we compare it to, um, you know, or we normalize it to body mass or fat-free mass, that relationship changes. It's, it's neutralized. And in fact, obese individuals tend to be weaker. Uh, this is more pronounced in the uh, lower extremities. We're supposed to be looking at uh, knee extension strength. Um, we think, again, that's probably due to changes in the muscle morphology or architecture, uh, as well as maybe some neural adaptations and just inactivity, right? We end up finding obese individuals tend to be a little bit less active. Um, now, this relationship isn't as, as identified in the upper extremities, however. We typically see this in the lower extremities. Why that happens, not exactly sure. Uh, but again, we, we see this, uh, but six to six, six to 7% lower uh, strength um, in, um, we normalize the fat-free mass in uh, the legs in obese individuals compared to individuals with normal weight. Uh, and, and again, you know, functional, the functional difficulties with, with various different uh, tasks, moderate to vigorous activities like stair climbing, right, or working at a more, um, you know, intense pace or level of intensity of exercise, carrying groceries, um, bending down or kneeling, walking a block, um, one or more blocks, uh, bathing or dressing, uh, that you know, tends to be an issue. A lot of them you know, may need a shower chair, right? Um, and again, that fall risk. And we typically see uh, levels of function um, with uh, obese individuals uh, decrease um, as their waist circumference uh, increases. So we've kind of a, a plot here uh, describing that. And again, as you see here, you know, as we move kind of up right, uh, for waist circumference, um, we start seeing lower levels of, of uh, a function. Again, men in the white here, women in the kind of the dotted. As we move up with waist circumference, function decreases. Uh, so again, some just considerations for PT specifically, transfers are a big one, um, you know, making sure we let the individuals do as much as they can. Uh, the use of a Hoyer lift, um, there's different mattresses that we can use, different types of transfers that we can use. Um, and then ambulation, making sure that you have a wheelchair behind the patient, monitoring vitals. Obese individuals may have a hypertensive response to exercise. Again, at rest, their heart rates are going to be a little bit higher. Um, so just be aware that there's going to be some differences, maybe some abnormalities in the cardiovascular response we kind of have to look out for. Um, and being able to realize that they might need a break, right? And if you're walking in a hallway with a patient working on ambulation and gait training, um, and they have to stop and take a rest break and sit down, like it's good, good to have that behind them just in case. And again, making sure that we you know, instruct nursing staff that it's okay to get patients who are obese out of bed. It's actually one of the, uh, you know, historically was one of the bigger concerns that obese individuals were less likely to be mobilized out of bed um, throughout the day uh, because, you know, nursing staff who's there 24-7 was apprehensive about getting them out because they're concerned. If they fall, like, what are we going to do to get them off the ground? Um, you know, I, you know, if they're a one-to-one -one or if they're you know, one nurse to so a bunch of patients, it takes a lot more time. So you see a lot more facilities with um, dedicated lift teams or, you know, in our facility, we have PTs educate nursing staff on transfers. So these patients are getting, you know, active throughout the day. Um uh, and also educating nursing that a Hoyer lift, right, is a completely dependent transfer, and we should only really use it if the patient is completely dependent. If they're able to do some part of the transfer, um, some part of it independently, right, like then we should be encouraging that, letting them use their muscles, right? Um, so that's going to require that we've got, you know, maybe multiple staff to help with that transfer, having the right equipment. We always want to make sure that we're matching, you know, task the patient and environment, that we're, we're putting all those in sync to ensure that we're safe, um, you know, both for the, for the staff and the patient. Um, and next, we'll kind of get into some um, exercise considerations and weight loss considerations for obesity. So um, again, similar 
to the, the things that you know, impact obesity, right? Or contribute to obesity, right? Weight loss is a little bit more complicated, right? Than, than we may actually be, be we may believe. Um, but here's some perspective for you. A large portion of obese Americans try to lose weight every year. Some say it's about 40% or, or sorry, 50%. Some say it's up to 70% of obese Americans attempt to lose weight every year. And most aren't successful, as we can kind of see by our prevalence, right, which continues to increase. Um, it's a higher percentage of, of women than men. Um, this is data from the CDC, which reports it at, at 50%. There are some estimates that it's higher than that, actually. Um, this is 2016 data. Um, and... Interestingly enough, we find that individuals of a higher income um, are more likely to make attempts to lose weight. And we think that may, may be related to what we talked about in the beginning of factors that contribute to obesity, right? Maybe you're able to afford going to a gym, affording a personal trainer, affording, you know, being able to you know, take time out of the day or even to get to a gym, right? So we see as, in, you know, as family income increases, uh, the higher percentage of individuals attempt to lose weight. Um, and, you know, similarly, too, in terms of uh, gender and um, or sex breakdown, 80% um, of the patients that get bariatric surgery are women, which is kind of an interesting thing if we think about as well in terms of um, social stigma, right, for, for, for um, 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 perception or, or physical perception or perceptions of beauty, right? Um, so we also see this in adolescence, right? So... Uh, Close to 40% of adolescents try to lose weight, you know, um, you know, per, per annum. This was, I think, 20, 2017 data, a higher percentage amongst girls than boys. And again, thinking about like social pressures, right, on women to look a certain way, um, maybe that influences different, different things, right? Again, it's, I think, broadly about what we're observing, right, what, what's driving these differences. Now, it's important to note that there is significant heterogeneity in the response to different weight loss programs, both in the literature and practice. Like many individuals who achieve weight loss goals, um, um, you, know, try, you know, through these programs often fail too. So like there, there's a lot of heterogeneity. There's not like one particular method that works for everybody. Um, and there's a lot of people out there, you know, trying to lose weight. There are some people who like lose weight initially and they aren't successful. Um, it's interesting that the, the, the number one method for weight loss, both in, in adults and in kids, is exercise. And we'll talk about some of the um, reasons why, you know, exercise alone may not be the, the primary, you know, should not necessarily be the, or at least the, the only measure that we're taking for weight loss. It's important, um, but not, not the only thing that we should, really should be doing. Now, the probably most important thing with weight loss is to be goal-oriented and to orient your goals. Many patients have difficulty establishing um, realistically achievable weight loss goals. Many of these patients set weight loss goals of 20 to 30 percent body weight, right, uh, within a, a year, which is pretty unrealistic. Um, and, and in a year would probably be generous. A lot of people think they can lose it within three months. Like that's really hard to do. Um, you know, and a more realistic goal, probably about five to 10%. And realistically, a 5%, even a 5% weight reduction, right, has huge benefits in, in your overall health. Like a huge benefits can happen from even a 5% weight reduction. You know, we should probably be trying to aim for about 10%. That's a pretty good range to be in. And it, it takes time. Right, like we're, it's not, you know, if we're making drastic weight loss changes within a, a year without it being assisted from surgery, um, that that's, you know, I you're on a risk of maybe putting that back on, right? Because you're not changing the lifestyle behaviors. You're 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 you know you're 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 making a kind of a quick fad change, right? And that's that's not the goal here. You know, you talk to most dietitians, you talk to most people involved in weight loss, obesity physicians and stuff of that nature, bariatric surgeons, weight loss, you know. Your goal should be at, at multiple months, at year length. But that's the perspective we're looking at here. It's not a drastic, quick fix. We're looking at changing a lifestyle, right? Um, and it's you know we're actually finding that um, realistically at eight weeks, like that's what's going to predict long-term response um, to, to, to 
to, to your weight loss program. Um, so when you're setting a goal for a patient, again, we're talking about two months before we're even really getting good data on how, how effective this is going to be long term. So just give you a perspective of how long a weight loss program realistically should be structured. Now, uh, it's also important, right, to set other goals in addition to weight loss, right? Many patients may fail to lose, you know, fail to lose weight, especially after the first, you know, you know, couple, you know, couple months or so. Um, but you're still going to relieve, get receive other benefits from exercising more, right? From moving more, from eating better, sleeping better, managing stress better, having better eating behaviors. Those should all be encouraged, right? You can even leverage how successful they might be at in meeting those goals to keep them bought into this healthy living intervention versus just calling it a weight loss program. Let's make you healthier, right? Which has multiple different um, constructs that we can make goals for. Um, and again, like if people, you know, if we focus on fitness as, as, a, as a primary um, aspect of this, focusing on fitness, hey, like, well, maybe, you know, you've, you know, your weight loss hasn't been where we wanted it to be, but hey, like now you can walk two blocks or hey, you can walk up a flight of stairs, right, without having to stop. One of the, probably the, the, um, the most rewarding goals a patient of mine has experienced that I've, you know, re- I've been a part of as a clinician is that they weren't able to get off the ground. Um, they had been so successful with their weight loss after surgery, especially, um, you know, and they, they had for many years not been able uh, to play with their uh, grandkid um, because, you know, if they ever went on the ground, they, they weren't sure if they could get off, get off the ground. So just they hadn't gotten off the ground in probably 10, they had been on the ground intentionally in 10 years and kind of forgot how to do it. So we I worked on that, and that was like one of the most amazing things I've like one of the most amazing things I've ever been a part of. That like they can now do something that's so meaningful to them that had nothing really to do directly with their weight loss. So we should really, you know, again, just get you in PT for anything, mutually determine goals, right? Um, mutually determine components of the lifestyle intervention that are going to be reasonable, right? Like that's that's the biggest thing, you know. We'll talk about adherence um, being probably the most probably the most important aspect of, of, of a weight loss, healthy living intervention. Is this reasonable? Is this simple enough to work for you to follow it? Now, exercise for weight loss. You know, the training mode uh, that you see most in the literature and in practice is aerobic exercise. Strong evidence to support this. Um, goals generally to get up to about 225 to 300 minutes per week. No additional benefit of going beyond 300. Um, now, Bit of frame of reference here. That is the goal for patients to get to. Um, I always frame this from this perspective. You can't go broke making a profit, right? If we're getting someone from zero minutes, zero minutes, to even 30 minutes per week or up to 50 minutes per week, like, you know, that's, that's not a lot of change, but that's 50 more than they were doing last week, right? And our goal is to get up to that 225, 300 or you know, roughly about 30 to 40 minutes every day or, you know, 60 minutes, five days a week, you know, four to five days a week, you know, that's where we went, want to get you to so you continue to lose weight. But, you know, you don't go from zero to 100 and you certainly don't go from zero to 300, right? So the goal we, you know, we typically approach a patients, especially if they don't have a history of exercise and have not, you know, prior to our services is, hey, let's just start you off with something basic. Let's try to get you, you know, 10 minutes, you know, five times you know a week, or even yeah, you know, let's try to get you twenty minutes twice a week. Like, let's get you somewhere very basic that you can do reasonably that you're going to be successful at doing, and you know, and then build up from there. Um, now, the problem with aerobic exercise um, for obese patients, especially anyone who's not again not a habitual exerciser, um, it, it may not be well tolerated, right? If you don't, if you've never, if you if you're at zero minutes per week of exercise. Like, again, even getting the 30 minutes, you know, 50 minutes a week, you know, that can be very challenging, not enjoyable, right? If you get short of breath walking two blocks, trying to convince someone to get 10 minutes of walking in a day even can be a tough ask. Um, so that may not leverage that enjoyable experience that's going to facilitate buy-in. Um, and there may be other psychosocial areas, you know, barriers to that, you know, you know that um, adherence. 
Um, so there are other options out there, right? So resistance training has been found to be more enjoyable. It's a little bit better tolerated. The inflammatory demands are a lot lower. So the breathe, impact on breathing is a lot less. So they can typically do weight training pretty well. However, for weight loss, not, not the strongest in terms of aerobic compared to aerobic exercise, but it has a place there, especially if we're trying to, you know, build up muscle mass, which helps, you know, increase your resting energy expenditure. It also helps you get around a little bit better, right? Most of our activities of daily living are strength-based exercises, right? So if you can make them a little bit stronger, they can do more things that may leverage into that buy-in that we're trying to get people to, again, adherence, consistency is the key. High intensity interval training, right? May also be an effective alternative. Now when we compare high intensity interval training or inter interval training as a uh, overall, doesn't even have to be high intensity. When compared to moderate continuous aerobic exercise, which is considered the gold standard, HIT, right, has similar outcomes, shorter training durations, higher levels of enjoyment. Because again, they don't have to do 30 minutes, right? What they can do in 30 minutes with continuous aerobic, they'll probably get that in 15, right? And again, it, it may be a little bit more enjoyable with those high peaks, a little bit of recovery, high peak recovery. So again, there's different ways to go about it, right? Um, and again, you know, that, that buy-in, so important, building a positive experience around exercise to facilitate behavior change, it's crucial. Now, um, the role of PT, right? Um, education, like talking to patients about like, hey, like, you know, you know what are some reasonable goals? What are, what, you know, what, what are things that we can do here to make you a little bit healthier? Um, so the goal setting, big part of that too. Exercise prescription, we're movement experts here, right? Like, you know, whether it's someone's, you know, trying to do a weight loss program or healthy living program, either with or without surgery. We have a role here in exercise prescription. We understand the pathology, we understand the functional limitations, um, and we can prescribe an uh, exercise-based re rehabilitation program to address that. So we have a huge role here. And I think probably the biggest is this, and that's kind of how I frame um, my clinic, is I address barriers that patients have to movement and exercise. Maybe it's they just don't have an education, they don't, they've never exercised. Right? They need a little bit of guidance and a little bit of just a, you know, basic program to start out with. Um, or they have um, pain. I can do things to help improve their pain, often through exercise. Um, or maybe it's a breathing issue. And we'll talk more about what we can do from that in our pulmonary unit. Um, but we have a huge role here. And again, it's not like we're short on patients. Um, so I really think PTs need to play a bigger role um, in addressing this. So um, you know, some ass assessments that you can include here. Exercise capacity should be a routine assessment working with an obese patient. Could be a six minute walk test, two minute step test, incremental shuttle walk test, anything that's gonna assess exercise capacity. You gotta match it to the patient's abilities, right? Like, like with any test. Strength and mobility, handheld dynam uh, dynamometry, big one, 30 second chair eyes test, five times sit to stand, a tug. Like let's get some data to assess like what, how well they're able to perform. Like what's, what's their, level of strength, what's their, what's their mobility, what's their exercise capacity. Um, you can, you know, your PT exam is not gonna be much different with uh, an obese patient um, than it you know, would be for any others. Now you have to be a little bit careful in terms of how we're you know, billing for them in, in states. You know, often you can't you know, put an ICD-9 code for, an ICD-10 code for obesity, but we can put an ICD-10 code for you know, deconditioning, right? If, they, if we can demonstrate that they've got a, weakness of some kind or an uh, exercise capacity limitation, or if they've got a pain issue or a balance issue, like we can justify seeing that patient for those issues and then work on you know, weight loss with them through that program of getting them more active and addressing their barriers. And our goals, again, um, you know, weight loss, energy balance, like in, increase energy expenditure due to moving more and then reduce caloric intake. Like there's no way around it. Like I had it this, on the scales here. I didn't really even get into it. There, there, there's no way around it. Like weight loss is facilitated by decreasing the amount of calories you take in and increasing the amount of calories you burn. We call this a caloric deficit. There is literally no way around, um, around that approach, right? No matter the type of diet, type of exercise routine you're on, that's the name of the game. Can you burn more calories than you consume? If you do that, you're gonna lose weight. If you don't do that, you're gonna gain weight or not, not lose any weight. Other goals we can focus on, improving fitness. How well can you get around, right? Like how well can you get around um, and do things, right? Functional mobility ties into that as well. 
body composition, right? Lean mass, fat free mass. Like that's not maybe a PT goal that you'll get from insurance, but like that can be an, an area of what we're going to focus on. Um, improving strength and mobility, like just you know, get the, you know, if they have a strength deficit, let's make them stronger. Now, some confounders are that you know, if you know, uh, you may not get a net, you know, a net energy decrease just from exercise alone. You may not go into a caloric deficit because it's really hard to do that without matching with diet, right? That's got to be a big part of it. Like we got to, it's people try to pit diet and exercise against each other, which one's more important or not. I mean, the evidence is pretty strong that diet will lose weight probably preferentially to, to exercise. You have to do a lot of exercise to lose weight, but like, you, you never do one or the other, and exercise is actually pretty important for weight weight maintenance, right? To maintaining a normal, healthy weight. But you do both. It's not a it's not a zero sum game. You can you got to do both. You got to move a little bit more, eat a little bit less. Um, um, we often find patients do as well when they start an exercise routine. Their spontaneous activity decreases, so that they actually um, you know they start an exercise routine. They work out pretty hard in the gym and they go home and do nothing. So um, just being mindful of that, and that's where the education piece is. Hey, like you still got to be active throughout the day. Exercises in addition to that. It's not replacing it. We're adding on, right? And that's like that's and I, where I think we have a big role. Like we can we, we make those communication points often every day in our clinics, um, and be broad and focused, kind of right when we're when we're focusing on our interventions. Think whole patient. That helps address a lot of these confounders. Um, other things that we can do, again, pick an activity that you enjoy. Find something that moves you. Build activities around positive experience that patients are going to experience success. It's that example we go back to all the time, right? Um, patients go back to things, people go back to things they enjoy, right? Like you go to a, a restaurant, you know, you have, you know, good, you know, good food, great service. Um, probably going to go back there. Right, but you go to a restaurant. It's you know super expensive. Service is bad. Food is bad. You're not going to go back there. Same idea. Positive experience, negative experience. You're going to go back to the positive experience. Develop a social team. Build a culture of exercise within your within people near you. We talk about the influence of social networks on on activity. It can be you know to our detriment. It can also be to our benefit. Like if we're if we're building around a culture of the people we interact with daily of exercise. We're probably going to be a little bit more active, whether it's just by osmosis or just being motivated, you know, to, to do things with your friends. That's huge. Having a workout buddy, right, to kind of get you through those those tough days that you're going to have with with a weight loss routine or, or exercise routine. Adding activity into a little bit of daily routine. The, the physical activity guidelines make this pretty clear that hey, like any little bit counts. So the more that you can do, the better off. So hey, maybe it's you know. We still want you trying to exercise, but hey, if you could even maybe take the stairs instead of taking the elevator, stuff like that, using different apps um, to track things. And I, I find this to be pretty important, whether you're doing it through um, an app or writing it down, you know, trying to be pretty honest with what you're eating and, and what you're doing for activity. So, you know, monitoring weight through scales, there's evidence to support doing this routinely or not. The biggest thing is making sure that you're you're being cognizant, right? You don't have to count calories specifically, but you know, tracking what you eat, right? It's being mindful of what you eat, being mindful that hey, like I actually need to be a little bit more active than I think I probably do. Um, and an easy way to do that is just to use an app or or at least a record of some kind. But the the biggest thing overall, consistency, not perfection. Um, again. You're going to have bumps in the road. Your patients are going to have bumps in the road. You need to be able to frame those expectations that, hey, like, you know, you know, rehab is not of any kind, right? A change is never never a straight line, right? There's doldrums here, you know, and eventually get, you get to the success, but it's, it's a journey, right? It takes time. Um, and our goal is not perfection, it's consistency. And it, the primary factor to predict successful response to a weight loss program is adherence. So anything that we can do, right, obviously within ethical boundaries, um, you know, um, it, it, you know, to facilitate adherence to to you know a healthy living intervention is going to be ultimately to the success of the patient. 
Um, it's true even for patients after bariatric surgery, like things, again, multiple options to pick, numerous options for weight loss. If people like to do a keto diet, that's fine. If people like to do aerobic exercise, people like to do dance, people like to do swimming, people like to do something, I can build a program around that, right? We can build a program around anything. Find something that moves the patient and food they like to eat. We often view healthy living through these like very tight confines that, oh, you can only, you need to do, you need a jog or you need to eat keto or you need to eat this particular way to lose weight. That's, that's all nonsense, right? I mean, those are all effective ways, but there is no silver bullet. There's no, you know, one way of doing things, right? Let's not view things through this punitive lens. Let's view this as this robust option that we can provide our patients. So um, with that, that wraps up our obesity lecture. Now, I hope after going through all this, we have a little bit more of appreciation for how complex this, this um, condition is. And then um, how, um, again, what we do with PT isn't much different um, with an obese patient as it would be with any patient. We just have to be a little bit more mindful of some of these things that uniquely impact these patients and then build programs, again, to facilitate success. So with that, I'll leave you there.